the Buzz Podcast, helping smart businesses be even more innovative. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Welcome to episode number 83 of the InnovaBuzz Podcast, designed to help smart businesses with an interest in innovation become even more innovative. In this episode, my guest is Kevin Kelly, who's a senior maverick at Wired Magazine, fascinating title, and author of a new bestseller book, The Inevitable. Kevin is widely admired for his acute perspectives on technology and its relevance to history, biology and society. Kevin shares some of his insights on this episode as we cover many of the topics addressed in his book, The Inevitable. Without further ado, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Kevin Kelly. Hi, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz and I'm really excited to have with me here today on this episode of the InnovaBuzz podcast, all the way from Pacifica, a beautiful little place south of the wonderful city of San Francisco, Kevin Kelly. Kevin, welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast. It's my pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a great pleasure. Now, Kevin, for anybody that doesn't know, Kevin is a co-founder and has been executive editor at Wired Magazine, where he now holds the title of Senior Maverick, which is interesting. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, he's a founder of Visionary Nonprofits. He's a writer on biology, on business, on cool tools. And um, he has recently, uh, last year, I think he published the book, The Inevitable, which is about to relaunch. Is that correct? Uh, it's just come out in paperback um, just this month. Okay, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to chatting with Kevin about all the things that he's done and, and in particular exploring the book, The Inevitable, a little bit more. Now, before we do that, Kevin, you've got a really fascinating background. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey um, from basically from childhood? What did you want to be when you grew up and, and how did you end up at Wired Magazine? Mm. Um, I was a science nerd kid. I built my own chemistry lab in my basement. I built a nature museum. And I learned how to do that from books. I was a avid book reader, and I very early um, was a how-to book fan, um, just devouring how-to books and learning how to do things from books. And I... Um, Learned photography from books. I learned uh, um, how to do all kinds of science from books. And in high school, I was, you know, doubled up in math and science. But by the end of the high school, I was really ready to do something else. Um, but there wasn't much choice other than to go to college, which I didn't really want to do because that seemed like grade 13. <laughs> um I couldn't really decide whether to go to MIT or to art school because I was really interested in art. But I gave college a try and lasted less than a year and dropped out um, and decided to pick up photography as my passion and learned. I uh, went to a residency where we lived and worked in dark rooms all photographed all day, the dark rooms all night. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, uh, that was um, interrupted by uh, an invitation from my best friend from high school to come to Taiwan where he was studying Chinese. And um, I went there for a week uh, before he had to come back. I stayed on and um, had my mind blown by Asia, particularly Asia in the early 70s. And um, I decided to photograph there. I was photographing and... Um, Eventually started writing about a travel and came back to the States, got a job at the Whole Earth Catalog, which was my dream because they were about how-to information. Mm. And um, one of the things they were involved in that I got involved in it was the, one of the first online communities, uh, which became the first online community to the Internet. And so I started living online very early, started writing about it as if it was a foreign country, <laughs> which it was. And um, that experience of being online and encountering a technology that was different than anything I had in terms of the conceptions of technology, I was kind of a little bit of a hippie. Uh, this was much more organic. Um, that changed 
I became more, more interested in technology in this new organic biological sense. Started writing about it and um, uh, started writing about digital culture before there was digital culture. I did mm-hmm. a, a publication called Signal, which was a precursor to Wired, and then got involved in the early days of founding of Wired, um, where I was acting as editor. Um, doing kind of what I was doing at whole earth, but now in a, uh, in color on glossy paper. Yeah. Yeah. That's a fascinating journey. I, I would have, I can really empathize with the love of photography. I, my first job was in photography where I spent a lot of time in dark rooms and photographing and then developing and, and actually building the film materials as well, which, um, because I've got a chemistry background. So that's fascinating story. Now in, um, the inevitable kind of looks at the future from a technology point of view, doesn't it? So, so you talk about some trends for the long term. You know, one of the things you said that that's fascinating is that technology is always in flux and it's always changing, which provides yeah. a challenge, right? It does, uh, because once we master something, the hard truth is is that we're going to have to unlearn it and remaster a new yeah. thing and right now that's sort of the state of everybody who's um you know uh who's graduated from school but but while the millennials get a pass right now as digital natives in five years from now they're going to be in the same boat having to learn something brand new hmm. pulling their hair out and wondering how we can survive um and they'll be having to learn new things all the rest of their lives as well. So that state of being a permanent newbie of always being new to that is going to be the the state of all of us all the time. That's right. Yeah. And I, I, one of my core values is actually learning and growth through learning. And, and I think that's served me really well in that sense, because with things changing all the time, it's it's completely natural for America. There's something new to learn, whereas a lot of people get stuck in in one particular thing that they've grown up with, don't they? Yeah. So this idea of lifelong learning, of learning how to learn, is the meta skill, the superpower that you want to acquire when you graduate. Is um, this ability to keep learning new things, and um, that that that's a curriculum that I don't. I haven't seen existing anywhere, um, and the, the 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 real golden key is to actually learn to optimize your own type of learning, to how to to optimize how you personally learned, to to scientifically, uh, methodologically deduce and dissect and come to to master how you learn best, and. Um, that would be an amazing um, superpower to give somebody. Mm, mm, that's great advice, yeah. Now, now, you also talk about artificial intelligence in, in the book, The uh, the Inevitable, and it's a really interesting take because a lot of people feel a bit threatened by artificial intelligence and they see it as taking away human jobs, but the, your point very much is that it essentially frees up us humans to do things that, we're best at rather than um, get stuck in mundane tasks, for example. I think every job is a bundle of different tasks, and some of those tasks are routine, meticulous, or uh, uh, in some ways measured by efficiency. And those are the tasks that will go to the bots. And then the other tasks in that job will be remade and altered by the fact that we've released those tedious parts and um, there'll be new tasks that are, that will need to be done because of the new technology. And so I think the picture is that most jobs will be altered by AIs and automation. Um, some of the jobs that have a lot of rep- repetition or a lot of tedium or a lot of uh, efficiency mm-hmm. will, will certainly go away. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there'll be plenty more new ones that come up that are unknown. So in the beginning, a lot of jobs are things that we don't know exactly what we need to do, like, you know, social media strategist. Okay, that was somebody's card. Social media (laughs) strategist. It's like, you know, we're not even sure what that means. And so in the beginning, 
this is a job for humans as they figure it out. And then eventually a large portion of that job will become routine. So then we hand it over to the bots and then we're on to the next thing. We have a new title. And in a certain sense, what you can say is that what our jobs as humans is, is to keep inventing jobs to give to the bots. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good way to look at it. Um, so uh, the other thing I found fascinating in the book is the idea of the sharing economy and sharing resources and flowing content. Now, I know you actually live this in a very large way. I was reading something about how you've um, basically gone back to just using your bicycle as your means of transport and done away with a lot of your material possessions. But talk us through a little bit about this idea of uh, the flowing and sharing economy. There's a general drift towards being able to use things that we don't own. So what I call the, the shift from ownership to access. And it began with like music, digital music, which, um, you know, there was huge servers filled with every piece of music that had been recorded. And you could get access to that. Uh, music that file kind of from anywhere anytime you wanted to so the question was well, why would you want to own music if you could just summon it at any time anywhere yeah. that's sort of the the um, the operating mode of you know Spotify Pandora and all these these streaming services which is that will just give you music you don't have to own it and so um, that kind of worked well then there was movies that did the same thing as a why buy a movie when you could just access any movie you wanted to, watch it, and then leave it behind? You didn't have to store it. You didn't have to hmm. catalog it. You didn't have to back it up. You didn't have to um, maintain it. And so um, that went on to books. That went on to games. And then, well, when I, we can't do it in the – we should be able to do it in the physical world. And, you know, uh, with, you know, cars, the advantages were obvious. It's like, well, instead of owning a car and having to park it and to insure it and to repair it, is you would summon a car. And if you could get one within 30 minutes, anytime you wanted one and then leave it behind, that was much superior than actually owning it in many ways. And then we could go on from there, like, what's next? What else could we imagine hmm. So, like, what about like camping equipment? Why, you know, why would you want to buy camping equipment when you could get the best state-of-the-art camping equipment this year when you needed it? Have it at your doorstep when you're ready to go. Use it, give it back. They would clean it, maintain it, store it, catalog it, repair it, upgrade it. That's the benefits of ownership kept diminishing, and the benefits of accessing something kept uh, increasing. And the whole thing was based on this idea of like instant on demand and for digital stuff that literally meant instantly. But it turns out that even if you could have physical things within a half an hour or an hour delivery, that was, that was good enough. That was instant hmm. um, for most people. And um, so with on-time delivery and 3d printing and all these other ways of getting things to you quickly, um, and then taking them away in some ways, disposing of them or recycling them, sharing them. Um, we could imagine this even in the physical realm, and I think we're going to keep going in that direction as the as the means of of, of de on demand delivery uh, expands even in the physical realm. Mm. Yeah, that that's a really interesting concept and I mean there's so many benefits to that you know I, I think of the camping example you gave I've got uh, heaps of things stored in camping and the last time I went camping was probably several years ago so they're out of date they're you know they're not state of the art they probably need to be cleaned and repaired before I use them the next time and they're taking up storage space so one of right. the things that occurs to me you know the the ultimate outcome of that is that you know we we all need smaller houses so if we're if we're not owning cars, if we're not owning other stuff that we store that takes up physical space. Right, right. Where, so where does that lead? Yeah, well, I mean, we can use rooms for other stuff. We can fill mm. it with art. So, and so, so, so one, <laughs> of the things that, yeah, one of the things that's interesting is, and I don't think that, you know, I don't think this means that nobody owns anything. Mm. I think what, what, what the general, what I'm guessing the pattern is going to be is that, um, all of us will have a certain small set of things that we're very, very 
passionate about and those are the things that we'll expend our ownership credits on you mm. know or we have a limited amount of ownership available and we'll spend it on you know whatever it is maybe it is cars for some people but it might be uh musical instruments or it might be you know you say art or photography or maybe it's clothes whatever it is there's something that we'll expend our ownership credits on and we'll indulge in that and we will have you know the, these things these artifacts whatever it is or even files that we just really tend and care for and then the rest of the stuff we're just accessing mm. and that'll be a different combination for different people um so you know so f for me whatever it is it might be books i have physical books I have, i'm in a two-story library right here <laughs> so maybe it's books and everything else i'm just going to not own but i own a lot of books um and so um and so somebody ultimately has to own these things and take care of them. Hmm. Uh, and so there will be some ownership, but it's not going to be the default stance. I think the default stance will be you access it and you own some things that you care about. Hmm. Yeah. Now, w one of the other things, and I guess this kind of leads into that in an indirect way, is, is the idea of content and attention. So if somebody um, is delivering that service of ownership of something that they make accessible to other people. They, they've got to provide information in order to market their services and get attention, right? And you talk about in the book about remixing content and, um, you know, the, the amount of content that society generates and how to how that's going to evolve over time. Yeah, the, uh, this is feeds into part of the problem about um, accessing one of the challenges is, is that... Um, we are producing so many new things. Uh, you know, the number of new songs written and published every year is just overwhelming. That's just the new stuff. Hmm. The new books, the number of new books, the number of new um, uh, videos, you know, YouTube uploading, I don't know, some crazy millions of hours a day hmm. or something. Uh, and then there's just the new physical things, the number of SKUs, the number of new objects, the things invented or, or peddled or made for sale it's just and, and those are all increasing the, the those the, the rate at which they're expanding is also increasing so as we look at like 20 years 30 years the number of choices that we have so we couldn't possibly even own all of those getting back to the ownership we, we, we you know yeah. you need a you need a, a warehouse and our homes are not going to become warehouses who wants to live in a warehouse our basements are just not going to become warehouses this is you want the warehouse in the sky to be available so you can just go pick something and you can actually probably get your camping equipment faster at your doorstep than it would be to find it in your basement. <laughs> yeah, that's right <laughs> so part of that is also the, you know the intangible world is also expanding at the same rate and um uh, news and media and so we're uh, having to employ filters and other technological devices to help us sort through all these choices all these options and opportunities which continue mm -hmm. to expand and we have a limited amount of human attention for this it's because human attention is the one thing that technology will never expand <laughs> that will always be fixed and what's interesting about human attention also is that we have to spend it that we can't even stockpile it we actually have to spend it every day and give That's it away right. <laughs> and you use it up and and the problem is that we're actually we're giving it away so if, it, if it's just, if it's the most precious thing there is which seems like it should be it's weird that we're giving it away for almost nothing. And when we spend time watching an ad or reading someone's email or anything where we're not doing it deliberately, we are basically squandering our human attention. And I, I, I think that um, I, one of the disruptions I'm forecasting, I don't think it's inevitable, but I think it's possible, is, is, is that we would turn to paying humans, paying people, for their attention and of course how much your attention is worth will be dependent on lots of things um, so one of the ways that people are going to uh, find you valuable is if you're an influencer so that we have this whole new thing about the influencer economy people trying to identify influencers and they're i think eventually going to be paid directly with cash um, for their attention just to watch an ad hmm. it's like okay you know i'm a i'm a I don't know. I'm a fashion house. 
and I'm going to pay you. You're a young girl with a big following. I'm going to pay you to watch this ad. You know, I'll give you uh, $2 to watch an ad. Um, and so uh, that negotiation of, of, of trying to identify the people who have ripple effects, who are not just influencing their followers, but who influence other followers, um, you know, and contracting with them directly for their attention um, is going to, I think, disrupt the whole advertising business um, in several different ways. One is because it disintermediates advertising agencies. If, if a company is going directly to the audience and paying them directly, they mm -hmm. don't need the advertising agencies. I can also imagine ads being written and disseminated in a viral way where you have amateurs making ads who are going to get benefit for people clicking on them. So, so in other words, um, the ads actually have a monetary system, micro credits or micro payments, where if someone is watching your ads, if, if you're actually able to get people to watch your ads, you actually get paid for that ad. And um, there will be a whole economy based around people making ads themselves, trying to get people to watch them. And so they're being paid by the company that they're advertising for. So, so I think this kind of a peer-to-peer -peer ad system where um, you have thousands of millions of people making ads, you have people being paid to watch the ads directly, um, you have a diminished role for the ad agencies. I think that's 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 a that's a possible future. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say that you know this is unlikely that to start with you know the Fortune 500 ads. They're not going to they're not going to go in this direction. But that's it's kind of like Google AdSense. Google AdSense was this peer to peer ad network. Yeah. They didn't displace the big advertising agency. They were they made their billions of dollars because they were putting ads where no ads existed before, mm -hmm. and a lot of the people who would be who would be making ads for others are going to be people who haven't who do have no ads already. The mom and pop Chinese restaurant down the street. That's what, that's they're the people who are going to take advantage of these people making ads for free and having them go viral. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so um, it's it's the bottom that benefits it's the same thing with you know video right so hollywood makes 600 hours of video yeah. uh, a year it's the bottom that makes videos that didn't never had those tools that 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 uh um you know this is this this was the new opportunity so hmm. it's the same thing ad it's it's all the people who aren't advertising who don't have video ads right now that's that's the place where this will first uh, uh appear hmm. Hmm. That's an interesting concept, and I think you see a little bit of that starting to emerge with people being paid to do surveys. But you make yeah. a really good point about you know the, the video, for example, is a great one of where um, at the grassroots people that didn't have access to that now with a you know fifty to hundred dollar um, webcam, you can do videos posted on YouTube at at very little cost and reach a huge audience. Right, and it's not doesn't really impact the Hollywood. It's not like Hollywood is hmm. making. Well, they are making films occasionally with iPhones and and cameras, but they they don't really need to. It's 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 all the others who didn't have access. There were yeah. the, the, the rural revolution happens, and the same thing with advertising um, and these other kind of disruptive technologies. They often begin and occupy this space where there is nothing right now mm. yeah it's fascinating now in terms of the remixing part that you talked about in the book tell us a little bit more about that because you you mentioned that you know it starts to blur the lines of ownership when people take uh, clips from existing content and mix it into their own content or mix it together with other content yeah um that's one aspect of the remixing which is you know reusing and that whole um, very very blurry ideas of copyright, which I, I mean, basically, I think the the notion of ownership in general in the digital arena and ownership about data is is kind of meaningless and a very very bad frame uh, for understanding or even for legally trying to um, regulate it. Um, 
you know, we're, we're kind of deep and maybe stuck with this as a, as a framework, but um, I, I think the ideal, the ideal uh, regulatory or legal framework for intellectual property, what we call intellectual property, is not to think of it as property at all, mm -hmm. and as, as uh, to not to, to impose the idea of ownership, but to have uh, multiple stakeholders multiple claimants with have they have both rights and responsibilities and anybody who basically touches some data has both rights and responsibilities and so like if you can imagine like a Fitbit okay so it's capturing your your steps so it's so it's my steps so I have some rights and responsibility to that bit the Fitbit company itself has some because they're producing it the the the, the telephone company the, the carrier has some because they're carrying it the server company has some rights and responsibilities the app store whatever the app is that I'm using has some and then if it gets to my medical doctor or whatever he or she or they have some rights and claims and responsibilities to this and so there's there there is no there's no ownership like owning land. It's it's these are all relationships and all uh, two-sided, meaning both rights and responsibilities, uh, claims on on this one bit that's that's created and moving around. Hmm. And um, uh, that means that you know it's complicated. It's complex. It's something that would you know basically have to be adjudicated in in computers and machines, but I think that's a much more reasonable understanding of it than to say, okay, well, who owns it? Is it the person yeah. whose heart or step it is? Is it <laughs> people who make the device? Who? who? And, and, and I would say nobody. I think this, this is a false question, a false quest to, to actually pin on ownership. <laughs> um, and so... Um, when we get to remixing, there's a lot of, of this, you know, can you own a note? Can you own three notes in a row? Can you own a melody? I would say this idea of ownership is just the wrong, mm. the wrong way to go. I think everything has its home. All creations have their homes in the commons by default, meaning they're publicly in the public domain. And we might give temporary monopoly to certain people or entities for the if if there was a social advantage to that, which is that they would encourage them to do something creative, mm. um, and then it would go back to the commons as soon as possible. Um, and so right now we don't have that model. We have oh the thing begins in a person that they own it by mm. default, and then maybe if they're generous or they die a uh, hundred years later, it goes back into the public domain. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is entirely wrong. So that part of the remixing is um, there, there's, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not setting aside the kind of legal stuff, but just talking about the fact that almost everything we make uh, that's a valuable is usually uh, uh, recompounding some, some elements that have existed for a long time. And there's very little that's really new. A mm. lot of it's really about unbundling things and rebundling them. That's um, right. No. Things that exist already. And that's, what my book does. My book is um, I'm taking uh, a, the found words in a dictionary, the words in a dictionary, and I'm rearranging them. I'm not really making up new words. I'm just taking hmm. all the words that already exist and I'm remixing them. And someone else can unmix them and remix them again. And so um, businesses, everybody is doing this, remixing, unbundling. There's really not much that's new and even the new things usually are the penalty. Like if I coin a new word, that's a, that's a penalty. You know, just getting anybody to accept it is very unlikely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Getting something to, to to actually find some value in something that's truly new takes a long time, and rarely is the inventor rewarded for it. So um, I think what the digital realm does is it makes that unbundling and remixing very easy. Everything is mm -hmm. very fungible. So. This idea of um, taking a genre, uh, remixing it with something else, making a wholly new genre. Um, uh, so, so, so 
when people make new things, they actually have the potential to just make a whole new platform, a whole new genre. And so this is the, I don't know, this is the, the way which is, is, is to um, keep remixing things. Hmm. Yeah, that's a, a fascinating take on it. And, and I think, you know, you make a really good point around the Creative Commons stuff. A lot of the things in the digital economy, I think, that have been really successful are, have come through that Creative Commons space. And, you yeah. know, people get to build on them so everybody contributes and so it becomes a better product as a result. Yes. I mean, I think if you look even at the origins of YouTube, YouTube, like a lot of, like a lot of things, basically ignored the copyright issues. There, there are several people who try to do YouTube, but they were, were really concerned by the fact of how do we deal with copyright. Hmm. Um, and YouTube went ahead and said basically – We'll ignore that. We're ju we're just going to post it up. Anybody can post it up. We'll just we'll 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 ask forgiveness later on. But we're just going to ignore this act of ownership of who owns it, whatever, and we're just going to do it. And that's exactly what happened. And they kind of over as they became you know with billions of hours, then they had to deal with some of these copyright things. But they generally have figured out how to do that in a way. Um, and what they figured out afterwards. And so I think that's one of the lessons, which is, you know, in, in the beginning with all this kind of stuff, ignore the, 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 these old ownership ideas and, 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 and listen to the technology itself. Hmm. All right, Kevin, I, this has been really great, and I'm aware that you, you're on a schedule. So I'd like to move on to our innovation round we call the buzz, which is for, you know, the audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions I'll ask and hopefully you'll give us some really insightful answers that will inspire the audience to go away and do something awesome. So first one is what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Well, the real challenge to innovation these days is to think differently and this is especially a challenge as we are more connected so the more you're connected to everything else the more you keep up with the news the more you are engaged with social media the more difficult it's going to be to think differently <laughs> and I think um, one of the things that I find that helps me think different on a consistent space consistent basis is travel it forces me to come at a different angle to th things to see things from a different perspective and um, so I would say my advice is um, uh, go to the most remote place that you can possibly imagine or afford to and think about what you might want to do to uh, you know to have a business while you're sitting in this other place mm. that's that's a fabulous idea yeah, I love it all right. What's uh, so? What's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Yeah. Sounds like it might lead right into that. Yes. Um, well, yeah. For, for, for me, you know, I have ideas sort of without. I mean, uh, the problem is not new ideas. For me, is actually execution, actually doing them. I, I learned something from uh, a mentor, Stuart Brand, who said that. Uh, you have exactly 10 minutes to act upon an idea when you first have it or else you lose it. Mm -hmm. And so, so, so that might be just a matter of even putting in a notebook, um, making, expanding on it, doing something. So, um, so that's one of the things that I try and do is I try and act upon an idea pretty quickly and then maybe I would say regularly after that to keep it alive. That's great so, advice. Yeah. I, ideas are pretty easy. It's, it's, it's executing the ideas. That's, mm. different. That's great advice because a lot of the time you think of something and it's very fleeting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, you're a, a tool person, a geek, right? So what's your favorite tool or system for improving your productivity? Mm. Um, what we used to call Elance is now called Upwork, mm -hmm. which is basically outsource as much as you can to people who are uh, world class in it and um, uh, 
you know, delegate the work to others who can work on this much faster than you can around the world, and um, you can even distribute it. So basically, it's to outsource as much of the work as as possible. That's fabulous advice. I love that. Yeah, great. Um, you can find almost anything you can imagine that you want done. Um, you can find people somewhere in the world via Upwork who mm -hmm. are really, really good at it and will do it very inexpensively for you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and do a much better job than you can most of the time Probably. as well. Mm. Yeah. I mean, some, sometimes it's just small little things, you know, like if I work in Photoshop a lot, like making masks and things like that. For They'll make a mask for 25 cents. I mean, it's just like, and they'll have it in, in a day. It's mm. just, it's like I could spend hours doing this. So. <laughs> That's right. I was just going to say that takes me a whole day. <laughs> yeah. Mm. All right. Great advice. All right. So what's the best way you think to uh, keep a project on track? Um have other people hold you accountable. Hmm. Uh, sometimes this is a matter of, in, of, of involving other people in, in, in the project, which inherently will bring some accountability to it. Hmm. Um, other times, if you're kind of a solo act is, you know, you can make public announcements about, you know, I'm going to do this, hold me accountable to having, you know, other people in your life involved in, um, kind of helping you stick to your deadlines. Mm, great advice, accountability. Yep, love that. Um, and what's the number one thing you think people can do to differentiate themselves? Mm. Boy, that's a really great question. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of how to summarize that. Um, the number one thing. Obviously, I've never given this a, th a thought before, but I, th but I think I think that um, I mean, first of all, I'm 100 percent in agreement that that's a vital thing to do. That that that's actually the long term goal for most people, either individually or even as a company. And um, I see it as a very long process, which is why I'm I'm, I'm having difficulty. Mm -hmm reducing it to one thing, I see it as something that will take most people individually their entire life to <laughs> figure out. Um, but I think um, maybe one thing I would say is um, maybe two things. One, one, one is to, to look where you to look where you spend your time when you think you're not working mm -hmm. as, as an indicator of where your true distinctiveness lies. Okay, I mean, so, so if you decloak it from your professionalism and let your amateurism, so to speak, lead you, um, and you kind of follow the free, kind of follow where you do things for free, hmm. that that would be a good indicator that your distinctiveness is probably lying in that direction. Yeah, it's kind of discovering your passion. Perhaps. Yeah, but I think we're asking about something different, and, and this is a distinction I make uh, a lot, which is I think there are kind of like three stages that most people – individuals and sometimes in businesses three stages that they have in their kind of their development and the first stage is is um you know uh setting out to, to actually be being able to find things that you that you're really good at doing okay mm -hmm. that you uh that you do well that you do better than average that um you are in some ways superior at um so that's you know doing it well is the mm -hmm. first step and that's a huge joy if you can find that and then the second stage is is that that, that then is that you're not only doing well, but you have some passion about it, right? That, that mm. you love doing it. And and for most people, if you can get those two things where, yeah, I'm, I'm really good at this and I love doing it, okay, they think that's, that's the hype, but it's actually not. There's actually a third one. Mm. The third one, which is a thought where you were going, the third one is 
Um, because anyway, oftentimes people, when they get to the second stage, they're suddenly flooded with um, a lot of opportunity because they're, they're doing things they're really good at and they love doing it. And so they have all this work. And the, and, and the third stage comes when you realize that um, it's not just that the real true state of happiness, maybe you call it, is in doing things that you're really good at, you love doing, but only you can do. Hmm. That's the distinctiveness. And so um, if you can get there, then suddenly um, you're really golden because then the issues of competition melt away. That's right, yeah. The issues of, of ease, anxiety, all those kinds of things vanish because you're the only one who can do it. And interestingly, your best work will be done there hmm. because you, it's only you. And you're kind of like the number one at that point because there's literally you – this is the only thing you can do. Only you can do it. And so um, um, that that's a, that's a long journey, and that's what I – so it's not just your passion because that's the second stage. It's, mm. it's the distinctiveness, the, 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 the true individual genius, so to speak, that everybody has, and it's arriving at that that's very, very challenging. And that's why I was suggesting it's – um, that you looked to where you're going when you're not professional as a way mm. to kind of think about w- where that distinctiveness might be. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's fabulous. That's kind of a total framework to determine what makes you unique and and how to actually arrive at that. Even though it may take many people their whole lives. So thanks for yeah. that, Kevin. Um, this has been really fantastic, um, uh, and I sort of just want to touch base on where people can reach out to you and get in touch and say thank you for what you've shared with us today. Sure. Um, my homepage is at my initials, kk.org. Um, I sometimes tweet under Kevin 2 Kelly, Kevin number 2 Kelly. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have Cool Tools website at the kk.org, which has one user written review of a tool a day. Um, and recently we've been offering a um, weekly free one pager by email called Recommendo, Recommendo with one M, Recommendo.com, which has six very, very brief recommendations of cool stuff that we personally are watching, hearing, listening, destinations, tools, tips, just six recommendations, very, very brief of great stuff. That's okay. at recommendal.com. Excellent. And we'll post links to all of those in the show notes together with links to the uh, book, The Inevitable, as well. Well, thank so, you very much. I really appreciate your interest in this time together. Yeah. Um, so just before we leave and wrap up, Kevin, uh, who would you like to have me interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Mm. Um, boy. Um, Who's entertaining? Well, you should have my um, partner at Cool Tools, Mark Freinfelder, who runs Boing Boing. Um, I he has a great nose for things that are coming. He's a nice guy, a great dad, um, an interesting person. Um, so you should invite him. Okay. Well, Mark, we'll be coming to get you, courtesy of Kevin Kelly. Thanks thanks so much for sharing your time today, Kevin. It's It's been wonderful. I've really appreciated your insights, learned a lot today, and um, I definitely um, want to keep in touch. Uh, and I wish you all the best for the uh, relaunch of The Inevitable, the paperback version, and also all the other stuff you're doing. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, My and one, one day we'll have to talk about photography too. <laughs> it's a okay. passion of mine as well. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Kevin as much as I did. He does have some really insightful perspectives and prognoses for the future and is considering a very long-term perspective, which is quite fascinating. For those who want to find out more, I highly recommend that you get Kevin's book, The Inevitable, and read it through. It's definitely a very thought-provoking work. All the great ideas and tips that Kevin shared with us today can be found at innovabiz.com.au forward slash Kevin Kelly. That is K-E-V 
I-N-K-E-L-L-Y, all lowercase, all one word, in overbiz.com.au forward slash Kevin Kelly. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Kevin there. We'd love to hear your thoughts about future trends in the comments section of the blog post. Kevin suggested I interview his Cool Tools partner, Mark Fraunfelder, who also runs the collaborative web blog Boing Boing on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So Mark, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Kevin Kelly. If you haven't already done so, head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you'll never miss a future episode. Of course, we always welcome feedback and reviews to let us know how we're doing. So while you're there, you might like to do that as well. If there's anything you'd like us to cover or questions you want answered on a future Innova Buzz podcast or guests you'd like us to interview, please send those ideas to us. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innova Biz. Remember, if you don't innovate, you stagnate. So think big, be adventurous and keep innovating. <music>